It's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the coach. Today, our friend Enrico says this. Ramsey, what's up? What's up, Enrico? Right back to you. What's your opinion on MMA fighters training three times a day, six days a week? How does this make sense? I've seen a bunch of fighters do that, and they'll often be injured and not be able to fight. Yeah, I've seen that too. And guess what else I've seen? I've seen guys training a single time a day, a couple times a week, and also get injured. So what's going on there? If you're getting injured and it's happening often, there's something wrong with your training. There's something wrong with the way you're scheduling it. Whether that is one time a day, twice a day, three times a day, etc. Now, as far as fight training goes, what I generally recommend for a professional fighter is two a days. I'm not saying you can't do three a days, we'll get into that in a bit. But generally, one of those training sessions is going to be focused on technique and sparring. One of those will be focused on strength and conditioning. Now, what does that mean? Strength and conditioning. Strength, we understand. Well, that means get stronger, right? Lift weights, do pull-ups, do deadlifts, do squats, do power cleans, do all these movements that will increase your athletic capabilities. But what about conditioning? Man, that's heavily misunderstood. So a lot of people hear conditioning and they think, balance on a BOSU ball, do all these circus tricks, run on a treadmill, try to get your cardio up, whatever. No, conditioning means conditioning your body to do a very specific activity. For example, a very common question I get, Ramsey, how do I condition my shins for kicking? Because doing roundhouse kicks and receiving blunt force impact on your shin is not something we're really naturally built for. You ever bumped your shin on the corner of a coffee table in a dark room and you're like, oh, oh, that hurts, right? Because we have a bunch of sensitive nerves there. And so, yeah, we've got to condition our shins to receive that type of impact before it's not such a big deal anymore. So if you kick a solidly packed heavy bag a hundred times a day, which might seem like a pretty big number, but it's, it's not really. It, it takes a couple of minutes to hammer out a hundred kicks. It's not really that much effort. If you're doing three rounds of striking on a heavy bag a day, I mean, you're probably hammering out a hundred kicks. And if not, just throw a hundred extras afterward. That's conditioning for your shins. Not only is it deadening the nerves to make it easier to receive the impact, but it's training you athletically, training you to be a better kicker, a better athlete, training the muscles and the ligaments and the tendons to respond athletically the way they are supposed to in a fight. That is conditioning. Conditioning is moving athletically in very specific ways to make your fight game better. So strength and conditioning. You can do that every day. You should do that every day. Six days a week might seem like a lot, but if you are periodizing your training the way you should, if you're training smarter, not just harder, that's totally fine. Same thing with technique and sparring. Now, most people are familiar with technique. You go to any any casual combat sports class, they're going to teach you some technique. You go to a jiu-jitsu class, the coach is like, okay, guys, let me teach you this guard pass. Let me show you that again from another angle. All right, let's go. And everybody reps it out a million times, and then they roll. So we're familiar with what technique is. We learn technique, or if you are a cage fighter and your technique is already there, you already know how to box and wrestle and clinch and do jiu-jitsu and all this stuff you're supposed to know. Well, there's always more to learn, but there's also very specific technical approaches you need to take. For example, you have a fight coming up in three months against a very specific opponent. You know who it is. You've done film studies on him. You know how he fights. So you develop a game plan around that guy and you rep out techniques. You practice techniques. You do very specific positional sparring in positions where that fight is probably going to end up based on those film studies you did. And you build your technique and sparring sessions around that. Now, here's where the third session might come in. And that third session is largely going to be technical. At least it should be. 
because if you're grinding your face into the floor in your technique and sparring and your strength and conditioning sessions to the point where you are so sore and so fatigued that you can't do it effectively the next day or you can't do something else effective the next day that is pushing you in the right direction to win that fight then you need to dial it back. You need to train smarter. You need to periodize. You shouldn't be killing each other in sparring, man. I've got so many videos on how to spar safely and effectively. Sparring is not fighting. A lot of young guys don't know this. A lot of people ask me for an opinion of that movie Warrior with Dan... What, what, what? I'm blanking on the name. What was his name? Hardy... He played Bane in Batman. Anyway, that dude, that actor. And in this movie, if you haven't seen it, the movie Warrior, this guy, he's this, he's this badass athlete who shows up to this gym and there's like uh, some stand-in for like Chuck Liddell, this badass striker who's sparring there. And um, Mr. Hardy's character is like, hey, can I spar with you? I'll, I'll jump in there and, and keep your fighter warm, something like that. And they're like, okay, hop in. And um, our protagonist proceeds to knock the other dude out cold, approaching the sparring session as if it were a title fight. And that, that's, that's problematic. Don't do that. Don't spar like that. So it, it made me angry when I saw that, that scene because... I thought a lot of young guys are probably watching this movie, getting inspired, thinking, I'm going to be an MMA fighter. I'm going to be like this character. I'm going to knock everybody out cold in one punch, and I'm going to spar like that. Ah, no, no, don't spar like that. Because you can't do that every day. You can't get knocked out every day. You can't receive a concussion every day. That's going to chop yours off of your fighting career. You don't want that. If everything goes well... If you sustain the minimum damage, if you are one of the lucky ones, then you might have a 10-year-long career. But not if you're sparring like that. Not if you're sparring stupid. So just don't. It might not feel as badass playing what seems to be a friendly game of tag in the ring with your training partners, but more often than not, that is the way you should be sparring most of the time. A lot of people think it's easier to develop skill in jiu-jitsu than it is in striking because you can go 100% or close to 100% as long as you follow a few simple guidelines like don't slam your partner's head into the floor when you're doing jiu-jitsu because you can rep it out so much with full intensity, with the same type of intensity as you would in a tournament or in a fight, but nobody has to die. Why? Because we can just tap out when we're in trouble, right? But, of course, in striking, if you're, a, if you're throwing a full-force punch at somebody's chin, they can't just be like, oh, no, it happens too fast. So we have to dial it back a lot. So that, cert that third session should be technical. So what are you doing in that third session? Maybe doing film studies. Maybe approaching the fight from a very cerebral level. If you lack a particular skill set... Like, maybe your boxing isn't great. Make it a very technical boxing session. Not a skip rope for 30 minutes, go for an hour, run, hit the bags all day, do a billion punches on the pads and spar for, for an hour. No, 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 not that sort of thing. Go over the footwork, right? Go over the technique, do the stuff that isn't going to wear you down, to break down your body, etc. But it's going to build up your mind. It's going to build up your specificity for the skills that you lack. If you approach a three-a-day training session like that, you can totally do it. Now, in Thailand, in Muay Thai camps, in China, at the sports universities, in Sanda camps, they do generally three-a-day sessions. And those sessions are generally two hours long, and that probably sounds like a whole lot. Because if you're a casual person who goes to a gym and you take, say, a Muay Thai class or a Jiu-Jitsu class or an MMA class or whatever, or a boxing class, you want to leave that class feeling accomplished. 
You want to leave that class feeling like you've learned something, like you got your money's worth. So you want to be sweaty and tired and sore, and you want to feel it the next day, like, oh, I feel those muscles. Yeah, they're, they're all sore. They're, gonna, they're growing. I can feel it. And if you go to the gym once or twice or three times a week, I mean, that's, that's okay. But if you're going to train every day, multiple times a day, you can't do that. Training is not the Rocky training montage. It's not. You see those movies where Rocky is just doing everything and they fit it into a, a quick, like, one-minute montage where that music's playing in the background, gets your heart pumping, you're like, oh, this is awesome, I want to be like Rocky. And you go to the gym and you expect that. <laughs> That's not sustainable. That is symbolic of a full fight camp, not what Rocky does within a 30-second interval. So when I went and trained at some Chinese Sanda camps and did these three-a-day sessions, I was expecting this grind like I experienced in some of these American combat sports gyms where they just grind your face into the dirt to leave you sweaty and sore at the end of the day, and it wasn't that at all. It was way dialed back. It was very technical. Nobody was getting hurt. When they sparred, it was very light, very technical. The Thais in Thailand, they call it playing in the ring. Why? Because they got to do it every day, multiple times a day, and they probably have a fight at the end of the week. And they can't go into the fight injured. They understand that we are not immortal. That our bodies can break down. They understand because of their intimate relationship with violence and how that violence pays their bills and allows them to eat and live and prosper they respect it. And if you respect the consequences of violence, you can more efficiently program a two-a-day or even a three-a-day training session. Now, here's a pitfall a lot of fighters fall into, especially, uh, you know, guys still learning the ropes, right? Guys still learning, I, I got to take a jiu-jitsu class, I got to take a boxing class, got to take a wrestling class, got to take a Muay Thai class because they lack these skill sets. And so they, they are driving across town to these different gyms that have these different specialties. And they're taking the public classes. And what happens in the public classes? They grind your face into the dirt. You run around, you get all sweaty. They have a whole serious half-hour warm-up before that. Bunch of calisthenics and all this. Not bearing in mind that there might be some professional fighters in there who already have a strength and conditioning session, or they should, and they're going in there sore and tired and possibly injured. And all these guys want to learn is the technique. How do I pass the guard? How do I, how do I not get my guard passed? How do I do a mount escape? They want to learn some really bare-bones stuff. And instead... They're getting the wrong programming. They're getting a bunch of junk training in search of specificity. And that's unfortunate. There is a lack of good training specifically for the sport of mixed martial arts. The UFC put out a YouTube video the other day. I think it was just yesterday. I was, I was watching it about the UFC Performance Center and they did some interviews with Forrest Griffin, for example. And he said, Mr. Griffin went on about how he, uh, he's been trying to solve this puzzle for 20 years, how to more efficiently train fighters in the best possible way without them getting injured or overtraining or, or falling into all these traps or running around town to all these different gyms trying to get the ideal amount of training, etc., there's a lack of that type of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's great that the UFC is investing into their own sport. I mean, that should be expected. It's taken them long enough to do that. But the public, the publicly available gyms, where you don't have to be a fighter on the active UFC roster to get into, they need to step it up and follow suit, too. Because MMA is not just take a boxing class and take a jiu-jitsu class and take a Muay Thai class. No, man. Because if you do that, you're going to spread yourself thin. It is learn this specific sport. Yeah, you got to learn. 
specific skills. But you also have to understand 80% of jiu-jitsu doesn't work in MMA. 80% of Muay Thai doesn't work in MMA. 80% of wrestling doesn't work in MMA. 80% of boxing, you know, these sports, because they are different sports, so much of the approach that you use to train for them doesn't translate to MMA. And if we keep pretending that it does, we're going to keep seeing more injured and fatigued fighters wasting their time. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train.